Scripture reading this morning is from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. For we are of the circumcision which worship God in spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man think that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching righteousness, which is of the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Our speaker again this hour is Aaron Birch. Aaron is a graduate of the School of Preaching in 2007, graduated from Freed Hardman University with his bachelor's degree in 2009, and in 2020 with his master's divinity degree. He's our Greek teacher at the school, very valued, very personable, very friendly. He has a wonderful family, his wife Katie and six children, and Aaron, I just learned, has taken on the work at the Marlboro Church of Christ. We're thankful to have Aaron speaking with us this morning. Aaron. I want to express my appreciation uh, again for the opportunity to speak this morning. Uh, thank you to the church here. Thank you to the elders uh, for, for the opportunity to speak and the opportunity uh, to, be, to be with you. Um, I asked Andy a little bit ago how long I had to speak. And uh, he said I could speak as long as I want to, but uh, you all are leaving at noon. So uh, I, I guess I might speak to myself for a while if I, if I go too long. But uh, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Have you ever heard of the most interesting man in the world? Uh, some, of, some of you might have heard of him. It's a, it's a social media thing. There's, there's this guy that supposedly has been everywhere and done everything. Uh, he, if you know something, he knows about it too. If you've been somewhere, he's, he's been there. And uh, I thought about, there's a lot of pictures, a lot of memes have been made about him doing various things, and I thought about getting one of those and putting it up on the PowerPoint. Uh, but uh, I did a little bit of research, and I, I found out that that advertisement uh, or the whole idea started with the advertisement for uh, an alcoholic beverage. And uh, so I didn't want to suggest in any way that, that we supported that or that, that I supported that, thought that was okay. So I tried to think about uh, who's the second most interesting man in the world that I know of, uh, but I couldn't find a good picture of Andy. <laughs> Is that a stretch, Marsha? <laughs> I'm sorry, that was terrible. Um, I, I in no way imply that, that I'm interesting. I have a feeling that I'm about as interesting myself as a blank piece of paper. Uh, I worked with a boy at school, or at the store, and uh, he talked a lot. And some days when he was bored, he'd ask off-the-wall questions. He asked me one day, or actually went around asking everybody, uh, what their spirit animal was. And so he eventually got around to me and he said, what's your spirit animal? And I said, my spirit animal is a raccoon. He said, what? And I said, a raccoon. He's like, why a raccoon? I said, because I want to do the same thing in the same way every single day and I don't want to depart from it. And if you interrupt my routine, you might get rabies. <laughs> Some people, some men and people, just live interesting lives. I think about some in the history of our nation. I think about interesting men like George Washington, just led a fascinating life, if you've ever read about it. Or men like, like Benjamin Franklin, They're just fascinating individuals that, that did all kinds of different things, went all kinds of places might think about people like Abraham Lincoln or even from 
from religious things and from the church, I think about people like Alexander Camel. Just a fascinating life to, to learn about, study about, and, and read about. In, in more modern times, uh, an individual that comes to mind recently is Elon Musk. Uh, the man's just fascinating to me. Uh, I keep watching the videos of the rockets and uh, just such an interesting individual. If I were to make a list of the most interesting people that have ever lived, one of the people at the top of my list would be Paul. Paul is just an absolutely fascinating individual. The, the experiences that he had, the things that he did, the places that he went, essentially that, that is our topic for this morning. Our topic is the life and labors of Paul. Such a fascinating life. Books, in fact, one entire dictionary has been written about Paul and his influence in the InterVarsity Press series of dictionaries. He's such a fascinating individual. And it really encompassed all of his life. I found not long ago... Uh, a short chronology of Paul's life. This, this didn't come from me. Uh, this was developed by Dr. Abbey. Uh, Brother Pugh had a handout of it and he had given it to some of the members at the church in Jerusalem and I happened to stumble upon it and when I saw it I'm like, I need that. That is a great short chronology. And so the credit to this goes to Dr. Abbey. Uh, he put it together after s- uh, surveying a variety of different books and dictionaries that talk about the life of Paul. And he does note uh, in, in his chronology that these are estimates. So understand that. We're not saying these are the exact dates, but these are estimates of what Paul did throughout his life. He was roughly born sometime around 1 A.D., uh, 1 to 5. And about 30 years later, he was present at the stoning of Stephen, somewhere around 33 to 35 A.D. Following that, very shortly, he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus, about 35 A.D. He spent some time then, according to Galatians chapter 1 and verse 11 through 12, in Arabia, roughly about 35 to 36 A.D. He returned to Damascus and was preaching there a couple years or so after that. He made his first trip to Jerusalem about 38 A.D. And then he returned to Tarsus, his birthplace, and spent a few years there, estimated around 38 to 44 A.D. He spent some time after that, according to Acts chapter 11, after Barnabas went and got him in Syrian Antioch with Barnabas and with the church there, about 44 A.D. Barnabas and Paul, of course, together would make the first missionary journey. uh, Or make the second trip, sorry, to Jerusalem with the gift from the church in Antioch to the poor saints in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 11, verse 27 through 30. He would spend a little bit more time in Antioch for another year or two, 46 to 47, and from there, Paul and Barnabas would begin their first missionary journey, Acts chapter 13 through 14, roughly about 48 to 49. A.D. They would spend time again in Jerusalem according to Acts chapter 15 during the conference there answering the question of what was required of the Gentiles. Did they need to obey the law? Did they need to observe circumcision? He would begin from there again his second missionary journey, this time not with Barnabas, but with Silas covering Acts chapter 15 through part of chapter 18. During that period of time, he would also write 1st and 2nd Thessalonians from Corinth, 51 and 52 AD. He would again go on another missionary journey, the third missionary journey, beginning in Acts chapter 18 and verse 22. He would travel to Asia Minor and Macedonia and Achaia, covering about five years, AD 53 to 58. 
During that period of time, he would write 1 Corinthians from Ephesus around 57 A.D., 2 Corinthians from Macedonia in 58 A.D., Galatians and Romans from Corinth in 58. At the end of that journey, he would return to Jerusalem and there he would be arrested. He would spend a couple years in imprisonment in Caesarea, about 58 to 60 A.D. He would travel then after appealing to Caesar, he would travel to Rome, and that would take most or part, at least, of a year, covering AD 60 and 61. In Rome, he would spend an upper couple years, AD 61 to 63. During that period of time, he would write the prison epistles, including Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon, probably a little bit early on, and then later, he would write Philippians and perhaps Hebrews perhaps toward the end of his imprisonment. He would be released from prison around 63 A.D. He apparently traveled from extra-biblical evidence to Spain, perhaps for a couple years, 64 to 66 A.D. He appears to have visited churches in Asia Minor and Greece around 66, during which time he would write 1 Timothy and Titus, and then would begin roughly his second imprisonment sometime around 67 A.D. Very shortly thereafter, Paul would be executed during the reign of Nero, toward the end of Nero's reign. Nero would commit suicide in 68, and so we know that at least by 68 that Paul had been put to death. That whole chronology begins really even before Paul was born with his childhood. Even Paul's childhood is fascinating. He was raised, it's clear from the Scriptures, by godly parents. He was circumcised according to the law, the law stipulating that on the eighth day a child should be circumcised. Leviticus 12 and verse 3. And Paul in Philippians 3 and verse 5 says it was on the eighth day. In fact, the idea is that he was an eighth day person. The point is that his, pa- his parents strictly adhered to the law. They followed it to the T. Perhaps that's in part because he was the son of a Pharisee according to Acts chapter 23 and verse 6 and Galatians 1 and verse 14. The Pharisees, of course, were those who strictly adhered to the law and not only to the law but also to the oral traditions. Matthew chapter 15. In verse 12, they believed in things like spiritual beings in in contrast to the Sadducees and also in a bodily resurrection. Acts chapter 23 in verse 6. His parents, though, were clearly... interested in his training as well. Commonly, during the first century, a Jewish child, a Jewish boy, would begin training about the age of five. He would begin training in the law and God's Word. And then, especially from a Pharisaic standpoint, a few years later, they would begin Pharisaic training. And presumably, Paul followed that course in his early adolescence. His parents were so interested in his training that they sent him to Jerusalem to study under the feet of the rabbi Gamaliel, Acts chapter 22 and verse 3. We don't really know a whole lot more about Paul's family other than his parents were interested in godly things and interested in the law and faithfulness to it, other than we do know that he had at least one sister according to Acts chapter 23 in verse 16 through 23. And she had a son, so he had a nephew. Perhaps he had others as well. Uh, We can assume, I suppose, that his parents were like any other Jewish parents in the first century and had as many children as possible, and so perhaps he had more. But his parents were concerned about him. They were concerned about his training. And so he was trained in the law. He was sent to study under Gamaliel. But implied in Paul's life in the book of Acts is also physical training. He was not only taught religiously, but he was also taught a trade. In Acts chapter 18 and verse 3, we learn that Paul was a tent maker, as was Aquila and Priscilla. Normally, a Jewish young man was taught a trade by his father. And so presumably his father was also a tent maker. 
Now, some point out that there were certain types of cloths made around Tarsus, uh, made around Cilicia. They were well known for a particular type of Sicilian cloth that was made from the hair of goats, uh, black goats. And perhaps uh, some have suggested that that's the idea in the term tent maker, and maybe that's the case. Others have suggested that the idea of tent making has to do with stage props based upon its, its basic definition. But it appears more likely that he worked in the making, manufacturing of complete tents. And if that's the case, if he completely manufactured tents, then what some have suggested is that he was a leather worker. If that's the case, leather workers were considered artisans. He was perhaps, or his parents were perhaps, well supported by the trade that his father followed and that he followed as well. And so they were interested in his training religiously. They were interested in his training physically, learning the trade of tent making. His childhood as well was distinguished from the very physical standpoint. According to the passage that was read for our scripture reading, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a pure blood descendant of the Hebrews of Abraham. They were as well, some have suggested in this phrase, Hebrew of Hebrews, a clear distinction between those Jews that had been influenced by Hellenism, that they had given over to Greek ideas and philosophy, whereas those who could define themselves as Hebrews of Hebrews were committed fully to Judaism and to the law. He describes himself as well as an Israelite. He had descended from Jacob. Because of that, he had a relationship with the Abrahamic covenant to things like circumcision, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, as well as a relationship to the Old Testament law, Exodus chapter 19, and verse 3 through 6, the law was given to Moses and to Israel, and so he was of the stock of Israel. There's some emphasis laid there as well upon the fact that he was an Israelite by birth. He wasn't a proselyte. He wasn't a convert to Judaism. He descended from Jacob and Abraham. In particular, he notes himself that he was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Benjamite. In fact, his Jewish name being Saul, he was named after one of the most prominent members of the tribe of Benjamin, King Saul. Paul's physical lineage wasn't just Jewish, though. There were Roman aspects to his lineage as well. He was Roman, a Roman citizen. Some have suggested perhaps he was even of the aristocratic class. He had been born in Tarsus in the province of Cilicia. Uh, Tarsus was located uh, north uh, west of Syria. Syria is here. That would put Jerusalem and Palestine a little bit to the south. Tarsus is located up here in Cilicia in the southeastern corner of, uh, of the province. It was one of a major portion of Asia Minor located on the Mediterranean Sea. It also had a well-developed port along the Sidonus River and was located near what were called the Sicilian Gates, a passageway through the mountains of Tarsus to Syria and also to Mesopotamia. Because of that, Paul lived in an area that was good for commerce. In fact, even the population of Tarsus was good for commerce. Roughly about a half a million people lived in Tarsus in the first century. It became a free city before Paul was born. In 42 B.C., the city was given rights of freedom. Because of that, and because of its commerce, it was also known as a place of learning, being the home of philosophers like Athenodorus and Nestor. Jews, because of its location, moved to the place during uh, the Seleucid period, that is, during the Seleucid kings, the Antiochian kings, 
And because they moved to the area early, they gained Greek citizenship. And perhaps, perhaps that's how Paul gained his citizenship. But we know, according to Acts chapter 22 and verse 28, that Paul was born a citizen. The fact that he was born a citizen was considered superior to those who had purchased their citizenship. There were only five ways that a person could be born a citizen or could even achieve their citizenship. They could be born to a Roman father or uh, they could be a, a citizen of a Roman colony. They could retire as an auxiliary soldier and be given their citizenship. Or they could be part of an aristocracy or a group of people that were honored by the Rome or by the government. Or the most common, being granted citizenship when they were freed as a slave. In what way that Paul's father received his citizenship or perhaps his grandfather or his ancestors before him is unclear. But it clearly gained for Paul a social advantage. Because Paul was a Roman citizen, when he was threatened with beatings, he could appeal to that citizenship as he did in Acts chapter 22 and verse 25, or as he did after he was beaten in Philippi in Acts chapter 16 and verse 37. Because he was a Roman citizen, he could appeal to Caesar when he felt that his life was threatened by the government authorities, which he did in Acts chapter 25 and verse 11. So here's Paul. He's Jewish by ancestry, but he has Roman citizenship. He's well trained, being trained under the feet of Gamaliel, being trained in the law, but also having training secularly in the methods of tent making. He's then developed further as he sits before Gamaliel, studying at his, at his feet, he's educated further in the law. He's educated in Pharisaic traditions and in the oral traditions. Gamaliel was a very important rabbi in the first century. In fact, perhaps the most preeminent rabbi during the lifetime of Paul. He was well respected according to Luke in Acts chapter 5 and verse 34 by all the people. He himself was a student of Rabbi Hillel, one of the founding rabbis of Jewish thought in the first century. He established, Hillel did, the more liberal school of Pharisaism. And perhaps Gamaliel was his grandson as well. Gamaliel was an aristocrat, a member of the ruling society, and also a member of the Sanhedrin, according to Acts chapter 5, verse 34 through 40. It was at his feet that Paul would study the law. He would study the Hebrew Bible and also Greek thought and philosophy. Paul would say about himself in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 14 that in his career, in his education, that he advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation. In fact, he goes on to say being more zealous than any of them. For the traditions of the Father, He was perhaps the brightest and most promising student that Gamaliel had. F.F. F. Bruce, in comments on Paul's life, said that but for his conversion, Paul might well have made his name as the greatest Pharisee of all time. He trained under the, one of the most well-known Pharisees and rabbis in Judaism. He appears from Acts chapter 6 and verse 9 to have become a member of the synagogue of freedmen that included men from Paul's home province, Cilicia. He was well known by the Jewish leaders and received letters from them, from the Sanhedrin, to arrest Christians. Acts chapter 9 and verse 2 and chapter 22 and verse 5. And based upon that, his diligent effort, according to his own statement in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 8, was to destroy the church. He sought to do that very diligently. 
He arrested Christians, Acts chapter 8 and verse 3 and chapter 9 and verse 14 and chapter 22 and verse 5. He placed them in prison, Acts 8 and verse 3, 22 and verse 4 and 26 and verse 10. He pursued them in Jerusalem and then he says in Acts chapter 22 and verse 19, in every synagogue, he pursued Christians everywhere they were, even to foreign cities, as he describes Damascus, which he traveled to in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 22 and 26, when he arrested Christians, in Acts chapter 26 and verse 10 and 11, he said he compelled them to blaspheme, to blaspheme the name of Christ. And when they were condemned, he voted against them. It was his vote to punish them, even to the point of death. Very simply, we could summarize Paul's career as he was the enemy of the church. So we have this man who was religiously trained by his parents, sent to study under the feet of Gamaliel, a man trained secularly in tent making, but a man that made it his endeavor, his career, to persecute the church. But there was a singular event that would occur in Paul's life that would change his direction would change essentially everything about him on the road to Damascus as recorded by Luke in Acts chapter 9 beginning in verse 1 through verse 19 or as Paul himself recounted in Acts chapter 22 verse 6 through 16 and chapter 26 and verse 12 through 18 Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus and the persecutor became the preacher. According to Jesus Himself, Jesus chose Paul to be a minister, to be a witness, to be an apostle to the Gentiles. He would summarize that in Acts chapter 9 and verse 15 as Paul was a chosen vessel. I want you to think about that for a moment. Who had a better background, had better training, to be a chosen vessel than Paul. You think about his training in the law. You think about his training in the traditions of the Jews. You think about his training in Pharisaism. You think about his secular training. All of that would be of advantage to Paul. In fact, even his Roman citizenship would come to his advantage as he was a chosen vessel to preach the Gospel to the Gentiles. Perhaps there was no one more better suited to take the gospel in the first century than Paul was. Who better to be a witness of Christ? And such he did. He became the preacher who had been a persecutor. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 23. But we see in Paul not just his conversion, but we also see in him this great conviction. Paul would travel throughout the known world to preach the Gospel. And as he preached the Gospel, not only would he preach it, but he would be persecuted for it. You survey the book of Acts and also the epistles. And what you find is that Paul repeatedly and convictedly chose to take the gospel and to suffer for it. It begins with his conversion in Acts chapter 9 and verse 23 and verse 24, where after he begins to preach, now the Jews plotted to kill him. He then traveled to Jerusalem, Acts chapter 9 and verse 26 and 29, and disputed with the Hellenists, and there they attempted to kill him. Then he left Jerusalem and traveled by way of Caesarea and returned to Tarsus, Acts 9 and verse 30. He appears there to have preached in Syria and Cilicia, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 21 and 23. Barnabas then brought him to Antioch, Acts chapter 11 and verse 26. He then traveled with Barnabas to Jerusalem with the Antiochian Christians offering to the Judean saints, Acts 11, verse 27 through 30. He returned from Jerusalem to Antioch and they began their first missionary journey, Acts 12. 
12, verse 29 through chapter 13. They went to Seleucia, Cyprus, Salmis, Paphos, Perga and Pamphylia, Acts 13, 4 through 13. They came to Antioch and Pisidia, but were expelled by the Jews, Acts 13, 14 and 15. They traveled to Iconium, where both the Jews and the Gentiles sought to stone them, Acts 13, verse 51 through chapter 14 and verse 5. They fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconium, until the Jews from Iconium and Antioch came and had Paul stoned to the point that they thought he was dead, Acts 14, verse 6 through 9. They left Lystra, went to Derby, and then returned to Antioch through Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, and Pisidia, Pamphylia, Perga, and Atalia, Acts 14, 20 through 26. In Acts 15, they traveled to Jerusalem. Acts 15 and verse 40 begins the second missionary journey with Silas. They traveled to Syria, Cilicia, Lystra, Derby, Phrygia, Galatia, Mysia, Troas. In Troas, they received the Macedonian call, Acts chapter 16, 8 through 10. And they travel eventually through Samothrace, Neapolis, and Philippi, where both Paul and Silas are beaten, jailed, and asked to leave. Acts 16, 11 through 40. They travel again through Samothrace, Neapolis, and Philippi. And then they pass through Amphilipos and Apollonia and stop in Thessalonica, Acts 17 and verse 1. There the Jews incite a mob and brought Jason and other Christians before the city rulers, Acts 17 and verse 5 through 9. Paul and Silas then leave immediately by night and they go to Berea, Acts 17 verse 10. But the Jews from Thessalonica come to Berea. And they incite the people against Paul, Acts 17 and verse 13 and 14. After traveling to Athens and speaking at Mars Hill to the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, Paul travels to Corinth, Acts 18 and verse 1. The Jews in Corinth opposed Paul, Acts 18 and verse 6, and they rose up against him, brought him before Gallio, the proconsul of Achaia, and charged him with teaching men to worship contrary to the law, verse 13. From there, Paul traveled to Syria, Sincrea, in Ephesus, Acts 18 and verse 18 and 19. He intended to go to Jerusalem, but Paul left for Ephesus, for Syria, and then Antioch, Acts 18 and verse 22. From Antioch again, Paul began his third missionary journey. He traveled to the region of Galatia and Phrygia, Acts 18. 23 and 19 and verse 1. Paul returned to Ephesus, Acts 19 and verse 1, until Demetrius the silversmith caused an uproar about the way. So Paul then traveled through Macedonia and Greece, Acts 20, verse 1 and 2, but left Greece because the Jews plotted against him. And so he returned to Asia through Macedonia, specifically Philippi to Troas, verse 3 and 6. From Troas, Paul walked to Azos and then sailed to Mytilene, Chios, Samos, Trigilium, Miletus, and Kos, Rhodes, Patara, Cyprus, Tyre and Syria, Ptolemais, and he ended up in Caesarea and then Jerusalem, Acts 20 and chapter 21. At that point, Paul then is arrested in Jerusalem. The people drag him and attempt to kill him. And because of the violence of the mob, Acts 21 and verse 30 through 36, the people shout away with him. Lysias also allowed Paul to speak to the people. But when the people shouted away with such a fellow from the earth, for it's not fit for him to live, Acts 22 and verse 22. From that time to the end of the book of Acts, Paul would remain in Roman custody. And I ask you this question. Why? Why did he travel so far? I don't know if anybody's ever made an estimate of how many miles that Paul traveled during that period of time. But it had to be a bunch. Why did he travel so far? And not only why did he travel so far, but why in every place was he willing so much to endure such a great affliction? Why was Paul so convicted to travel and to suffer. And it seems that there's only one answer. That Paul was to endure all the travel. Paul was to endure all the sufferings because Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. 
without the road to Damascus, there's no explanation for Paul's conviction. Paul was convicted because he believed that Jesus had risen from the dead so that he would say about himself, I am not worthy, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9 and 10, I am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God I am what I am. And His grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Why did Paul labor as he did? Why did he give so much? Why did he travel so far? Why did he endure so great persecution? It's because he saw Jesus. He witnessed the resurrected Christ and a singular event in his life changed everything. The one that had persecuted the church became the preacher. The book of Acts ends with Paul in Roman custody. From extra-biblical evidence or history, it appears that Paul would be released from this Roman imprisonment, that he would have the opportunity to travel to Spain as he intended to do, that he would travel as well again to Macedonia and Asia Minor. But no matter how much longer that Paul would live, the terminus of his life by AD 64 was no more than a handful of years. So much so that he would write himself to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6 through verse 8, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. Secular history indicates that Paul would die from beheading, that he would be incarcerated again, and as a Roman citizen, he would have the benefit of beheading. Paul would give his life for Christ. Paul would give his life, even as he lived, as he himself would say, to live is Christ and to die as gain. He would give His life as He traveled. He would give His life as He suffered. And He would eventually give His life fully to serve Christ. With His martyrdom, however, Paul went to await the day in which the Lord would return. The day in which the Lord would grant him the crown of life. Paul is certainly one of the most interesting individuals that has ever lived. Raised a Jew, enjoying Roman citizenship, but seeing the resurrected Christ and preaching Him the rest of his life. Looking toward that crown that Jesus would bestow upon him. Paul notes, however, himself, that that crown isn't available just for him. He would continue in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8 and say that on that day, Jesus would give him a crown. But he continues and says, but not to me only, but to all who have loved His appearing. You see, Paul sets an example in his conviction of his willingness to suffer for Christ, of his willingness to preach Christ, but also in his anticipation of the crown that Christ would give, the same crown that you and I can enjoy as well. The crown that we can have. That if we, like Paul, are converted to Jesus and turn to Him... We could ask the same question that was asked of Paul. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized 
calling upon the name of the Lord, washing away your sins and calling upon the name of the Lord. Have you done that this morning? Is there a crown awaiting you on the day the Lord returns? If you've not obeyed the gospel, won't you do so this morning? If you believe, like Paul did, that Jesus was the Christ, if you're willing to repent of your sins, to change your life, like Paul did, if you are willing before men to confess that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, then you can be baptized like Paul was. Immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins and you can be raised to newness of life and have the hope of eternal life. Have the forgiveness of sins and look forward to the crown that Jesus will place upon your head when He returns. Perhaps you've done that this morning but maybe you've not been faithful. Paul challenges us as well, I think, to do that. In the face of persecution, in the face of difficulty, in the face of need, to be faithful, to be convicted to Christ no matter what may come. Perhaps this morning you've fallen away from that. Won't you make the decision this morning to make that right? If you need our prayers, if you need our encouragement, won't you come as well? Return to Christ this morning. And so if you need to become a Christian or if you need to come back to Him, won't you come as we stand and sing the invitation song?